Hi everybody. Good Shabbat to you. And uh, I greet you with Scout here at my side looking for a snack somewhere. From a very hazy, smoky, and tragically uh, low air quality day in Colorado Springs. We've got fires, as you well know, in my home state of California. Hundreds of them. All the way from... Uh, uh, the coast of California to the uh, eastern border of Colorado. It's not good. Um, okay, well, uh, I'm starting a new series today. And uh, if I stretch my theology, I suppose uh, even the smoky days are possible, uh, maybe minor index of the days that we're going to continue to cover. But this particular topic is bigger than all of my pay grades over a lifetime. Uh, I'm a little surprised that I'm tackling it. I know uh, Dean and a couple of other people said, hey, why don't you take you know a few weeks and, and digest it all uh, before you tackle it. But you know what? Uh, it, that is generally very sound advice, but my, my sense is there's a quickening uh, in my own heart, mind, and spirit. There's a quickening of pace on everything uh, regarding everything that's going on out there so uh, I thought I'd dig in and as almost always now even though I've done this sort of thing for 40 years study the times and, and try to bring theology and doctrine to their analysis uh, I've never done it to this extent at this pace to these depths uh, and many of the topics therefore are not new to me but the details are new so uh, we're all kind of I've said this a number of times we're all on a steep learning curve and we're learning on the fly. We're learning on the run. As the troops go forward, if you want to use a military metaphor, which I think is pro totally appropriate to uh, the times, and, and uh, again, sound doctrine, we are learning as we go. Uh, today, the topic, first of a uh, three-part series again, notes on the historic Abraham Accord, Israel's Freedom or America's Last Day's Rubicon. Leave it in the form of a question mark, although, as with anything, I have very strong opinions already formed. I remember a student a long, long time ago in a place far, far away uh, in a classroom. We were in furious debate, and I was just letting the students go, and I don't remember the topic. And finally, they stopped in 10, 15 minutes in and says, hey, let's ask Dr. Kelly. He's got an opinion about everything. Uh, true. I'd rather be that way than one... Uh, in a sort of indifferent neutral position, although having lots of opinions can be a danger as well. That's why I go to a great extent, uh, great extents to document. When I say opinion, I use the phrase informed opinion. I have lots of opinions, some right, some wrong, but I will document them into the dust so that at least you can uh, you can look look into them. Uh, okay, let's open into prayer and a very very important scripture, and we'll get on, Father. I'm a little bit hurried today because I'm a little bit late since it takes 4.7 days <laughs> to upload these things on, onto the uh, internet, onto uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, whatever. So uh, regulate my pace and my thought process and my words according to everything that pleases you. Eliminate my errors as much as possible and bring forth clarity in a very, uh, what? A very large and a very complex system of ideas concerning the last days, concerning peace treaties with Israel and uh, the attendant nations, and most important, uh, uh, as importantly, uh, the role that America is or is not to play in all of this treaty making. We thank you and praise you for your mind and no one else's in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, here we go. Here's the, uh, I, I had several scriptures about uh, covenants and accords and treaties and agreements. I kept being brought back to the one that is iconic in the sense that we have all looked at it probably m many times, but now it is pregnant with meaning. I believe it's appropriate to use that uh, metaphor. It, it, it is rich with implications for what we're watching in the news right now. Um, Genesis 12, one through three. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred <clears throat> and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee. 
and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Purposely chose the King James Version because I believe the passage it deserves every uh, ounce of dignity and high language as we can give it. A um, couple of quotes about this very important passage of scripture. First from Charles Spurgeon, uh, who I consider uh, one of the great minds and scholars of scripture. And no, I don't agree with everything he wrote either. <laughs> I was going to say something, but it's <clears throat> a little off topic, so I'll restrain myself. Here's what Spurgeon wrote in a sermon delivered on the Lord's Day evening at Metropolitan Tabernacle, Newington, England, January 22nd, 1893, on this passage. Abraham's life, taken literally, is full of instruction, but we shall be wise to take the spirit of it and endeavor to make it our own. <clears throat> Excuse me. We cannot live just as Abraham did, but we can carry out the great principles which lay at the root of Abraham's life. And if the Holy Spirit will work in us like a degree of faith to that of the Holy Patriarch, faith being the key word, we may glorify God by our lives, even as he did. You know, faith is kind of a scary word to me. I've not been a great uh, uh Faith lady, a faith, somebody just signed lady, lady Leah, uh, a faith um, uh, example, uh, much too much an empiricist. I, I could swear I actually heard the Lord tell me in probably the first audible word I ever heard from him, Didymus. Uh, you know, that's the name for doubting Thomas. Uh, with science background uh, and skepticism is my middle name sometimes. Uh, faith has been a struggle for me. Uh, it's getting better, though. Um, so we'll come back to that <clears throat> that point a little into this uh, down the road. Second one is from somebody named Dr. Stephen Cook, uh, a notable scholar. I always vet my sources best I can. And he wrote this about this uh, passage in an essay called God Loves Israel from a journal thinking on scripture or a blog. God loves Israel declaring I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, 3. God is eternal and his love is eternal. Now listen to this. To possess the love of God is to love that which he loves and hate that which he hates. I've made this point before and it's upset a few people. That's how the text reads. One cannot claim, hear this now. One cannot claim to have God's love and simultaneously hate Israel. Can't be done. His chosen people. There is no place for anti-Semitism in the heart of any Christian. There is no place for a hint of anti-Semitism in the hearts of God's people. Non-negotiable, according to what God has written. Finally, uh, no relation, Matthew Cook. Can't remember who, oh, this is, yeah. He's a pastor. Uh, Bible scholar, this from Sermon Central, The Certainty of God's Promises, May 3rd, 2005. It makes a little different point on the same matter. Um, and it goes, to, it goes to the nature of the age in which we live today. And I know you can see that as soon as I uh, begin to quote it to you. We live in an era of unkept promises. You know, <laughs> I just want to let that linger a little bit in the air. We do. I was just listening to one of the news stations today. That is, it's you can see, it's always on. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the various discussants, uh, a couple of conservatives and liberals, and all sitting at the table, basically saying, you know, we we can know. I think it was one commentator who really struck me said something about. <clears throat> There are deaths going on from coronavirus right now. There's a death going on in the controversy that even masks have created because everybody's willing to nearly to kill anybody, whether or not you should wear or not wear a mask. And then he said something even more pressing and more prescient to the point. 
there's another death going on in terms of the death of our trust in our institutions, political, social, education. Uh, that, I think, is the most tragic death of all because underlying it, to me, is what I'm going to argue for today and somewhat starker. To each time I do this, I get a little bit more pointed, a little bit more sharper edged, a little bit more intense, a little bit more focused because I, I think I'm supposed to. Underneath those kinds of deaths going on in American culture and life is uh, a spiritual death. That's the one that we must attend to an intellectual reflection and spiritual and prayerful uh, uh, study to try to understand if there be any chance of uh, moving us off this path of destruction. Uh, we have to attend to that. So um, we live in an era of uncapped promises. Nations sign important treaties and then break them at will. I've never seen anything like this in all my long days, long life. And many couples show little regard for their wedding vows. In this kind of society, this was written in 2005, 15 years ago. Fast forward to 2020. In this kind of society, we who are God's people should be known for keeping our promises instead of breaking them, breaking covenant with each other, but mostly with God which is rampant either by open confession or by silence. We are breaking covenant with God faster than I can write words on this page. I don't always do this, but one news item popped up uh, in front of me, both from uh, broadcast and print media that I wanted to just insert here, sort of as context setting. Just one event is worth noting today for that context. I just learned as you're learning, and I and I, I always, I, I love to look at graphic displays, uh, computer projections, start. I mean, I learned that in grad school. I have never gotten over it. I like that sort of thing, uh, modeling, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very imprecise many times, but it gets us in the ballpark. So I looked into this a little bit. Tropical storms Laura and Marco are soon to reach hurricane strength as they reach the Gulf of Mexico at roughly the same time. I listened to three different reports. I'm not sure I could depend on that. At, for the first time, there have been two hurricanes at the same time in the Atlantic, but not this close in proximity, with one report saying they're going to strike the Gulf Coast possibly on the same day. That's crazy. Remember I said more than once, always look for the word um, unprecedented. Whenever I hear a report, uh, this has never happened before uh, in recorded history. Uh, we've never known of this to uh, happen any time earlier or that sort of thing. Those are, those are markers. Those are markers that you need to pay attention to. And the dogs are having a good time barking at strange people in the yard. Um, so these two hurricanes reaching hurricane strength, apparently, according to the models, in the next day or so. Uh, display probable impact cones that stretch all the way from western Florida west to west Texas on the Gulf Coast. It looks so far today, at least, like it's going to strike uh, somewhere between uh, New Orleans and Houston, but we don't know for sure. Uh, both to make landfall on the same day, again, for the first time in recorded history. That for a sense of moment. I'm not trying to sensationalize, I just read. I mean, I just read. And as I told you before, I'm trained to look for patterns. Um, sometimes I suffer the details, but I, I tend to be pretty good at looking for patterns. All right, first thoughts. So do I set out on this three-part, daunting three-part series for, uh, uh, and to discuss the newly minted Abraham Accord, more formally known as the Israel, and I quote, Israel United Arab Emirates Peace Agreement agreed upon August 13th, 2020. This makes the UAE the third Arab nation to make such accord with Israel, the first being Egypt in 1979 and then Jordan in 1994. So this is the first of three. It will be very important to look if there's an accumulation, a, a kind of a snowball effect now for other Arab nations to begin to gather. At the same time, look for nations that don't want any part of this because that becomes 
indicative of some passage uh, passages from uh, the prophets a little bit later down the road that uh, will not participate in such a piece. And that could be significant, as significant as this. Thesis, that said, let me state in unambiguous common vernacular, uh, the Abraham Accord is a really, really, really big deal. A really big deal. Uh, that's my early assessment. If I'm wrong, I'll go on camera and we'll say that uh, I'll eat some more crow again. Hasn't been a lot of crow eating because the, sig the signs are so blatant uh, and in our faces today. Um, indeed, as the president has recently claimed, this is part of the deal of the century. Now, in that phrase, he is referring to the larger uh, peace accord. His larger, he calls it the peace to prosperity, a vision to improve the lives of the Palestinian and Israeli people. Larger than this, down the road, I'm believing already that those two accords, those two treaties, those two contracts, as it were, those two agreements, are going to be fixed fast to one another. If I'm right, that's very important for you to know. Uh, that was unveiled at a House, uh, White House press conference along with. Uh, PM Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel 160 days earlier on January 28th, 2020. It's interesting to me. It's in, in patterns again. 2020, 2020, 2020. It's quite a year for, for a variety of reasons. And that's part of the pattern here. We look for patterns in trying to understand the times without inventing them. We look for them. Um, I'll deal with that larger treaty, treaty uh, at a later time. If I dare, and I probably will. So here's the Abraham Accord, the full text of the joint statement of the United States, State of Israel, and the United Arab Emirates. I'll read some of it. It's fairly long, a couple pages. President Donald J. Trump, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, spoke today and agreed to the full, important word, normalization of relations between Israel and the United Emirates. This historic diplomatic breakthrough will advance peace in the Middle East region and is a testament to the bold diplomacy and vision of the three leaders and the courage of the United Arab Emirates uh, and Israel to chart a new path that will unlock the great potential in the region. All three countries face many common challenges and will mutually benefit from today's historic achievement. This sounds wonderful. Done. Peace in the Middle East. I'll let you read the rest of it, and I'll point out some things to look for as we go into the study a little bit more deeply. Uh, by the way, that these uh, these first two sources that I'm uh, quoting from are both Arab sources. I don't know why. It could be my lack of scholarship. I could not find the full text of the whole treaty anywhere. And the closest I got were to two Arab sources that quoted the full text of this uh, announcement and then quoted a number of the details of the actual treaty without quoting it word for word from another Arab source. I say that in the interest of full disclosure. Everybody's got biases. Uh, but I still was able to capture, I believe, the essence of what we're needing to study today at this early stage of development of this very, very important event. So the formal treaty, unfortunately, I mentioned here, I've not yet obtained access to the actual text of the treaty itself. Will later, I hope. Uh, for now, we'll respond to the more general summary information that is available to us online. Second, uh, I'll be presenting all this in three installments. You probably already saw it from my announcement on the bulletin board on Facebook. Uh, section one today, the covenant. Section two on Wednesday next, uh, the concessions that all parties to this must have had to make. And that's a really important area, huge important, uh, hugely important area. Uh, what's given up, especially by Israel. Number three, the consequences, the impact. What are the geopolitical effects on international and world order? Big, big stuff. Yeah, I can't, can't even believe I'm trying this. Uh, this is how I believe I was directed. So now let's turn to the accord itself. This particular part of the review will be adapted from uh, a publication 
Iasbaba, uh, August 19, 2020, obviously an Arab uh, uh, online journal. And I will go section by section, subpoint by subpoint, so that we are, we are literally on the same page. Here are the sections. I probably should have numbered them, but uh, the first one, two, three sections. Yeah. Uh, first section, clauses of the agreement. This refers to the basic, uh, the major elements of the agreement, the articles, stipulations, provisos specified in the treaty to which all parties must agree. All three parties must agree. Uh, and here they are. Uh, first, the deal states that the UAE would, quote, recognize the state of Israel. That's a big deal. The Arab states have not, since their founding in 1948, been willing to do that, and they're willing to shed blood over it to avoid doing that. So that's that's not insignificant, historically and, I think, theologically. Uh, and establish formal diplomatic relations with it, while Israel would halt its controversial plan to annex swaths of the Palestinian West Bank. Let me say that again. Get your pens out. Note this when you come to it in the text. Israel would halt its controversial plan to annex swaths of large swaths of the Palestinian West Bank. They would just not do it anymore. They would not lay claim to it. They would cede it to the Palestinians. Okay, we'll come back to that at a later time. Uh, next, in the next few weeks, Israel and the UAE will finalize bilateral ties and cover areas of investment, tourism, security, technology, energy, environmental issues, and the establishment of embassies, in addition to other areas of cooperation. It sounds wonderful. Some of my friends have written me and told me how wonderful it is. Millions of Americans are shouting that this is the biggest thing to happen in the Middle East since that accord was struck uh, by Anwar. Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin in 1979. I remember that day. I remember watching it on TV. Lots of backstories to that, too, that are fascinating historically. Uh, next, the joint statement mentioned that Israel and the UAE would also be, quote, forging closer people-to-people -people relations. That sounds good. I, you know, that sounds right. And finally, in this section, the statement also said that Israel would focus its efforts now on Expanding ties with other countries in the Arab and Muslim world, make that read, to gather them in to join with this agreement and form a new coalition of peace in our time. And that the U.S. and UAE would be assisting in achieving that. Make that read, and America would be leading in that effort. Selah. Second major section, politics of the agreement. This involves the geopolitical strategies implicit in the agreement, the politics of it, if you will, uh, you know, uh, kind of a little bit of the backstory without much speculation. I mean, this is kind of common sense politics and analysis as agreed upon by the principal parties. Number one, domestic politics of Israel. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, as you, if you're reading about it, is in a lot of trouble. He's under indictment for corruption. Uh, and so uh, there's this idea that uh, Netanyahu has been facing mishandling of the coronavirus outbreak, outbreak and other more personal matters on trial for corruption, maybe banking on this agreement to revive his image. Is that far-fetched? Are you kidding? Can you spell politics? That's the way it, that's the way it rolls, baby. Uh, baby? I don't know why that came out. <laughs> I, I call a lot of people baby because I'm so very old. Um, so that's simply no surprise to me. Second, domestic politics of USA. This agreement brokered by the United States is seen as diplomatic, is a major diplomatic win for President Trump ahead of the November elections, which I continue to argue more and more forcefully. <clears throat> I was going to say a Maginot line, somewhat, a Rubicon, somewhat more. That election day is massive now in its political, in its theological, in its practical uh, implications for American, what Russell Kirk called the American order. This is the biggest election in our history, including the first and including that of 1860, which I think I mentioned last time. Huge. Uh, so in seeking re-election, uh, of course, this could be a major boost for him in the polls, which are down. 
uh, his other foreign policy bets in Iran, North Korea, and Afghanistan kind of pretty much blew up in his face. So he's, I, I think, without, you know, making this totally pejorative, just as objective an assessment I can make, yeah, this is a big deal. There are some who would argue also that's a, a pretty, pretty strong diversion from some other trouble areas of his uh, Politics of the UAE, the agreement further burnishes its international campaign to be seen as a beacon of tolerance in a nation that's absolutely iron tight authoritarian. So, you know, everybody, everybody's in it to win it, boys and girls. And then finally, a collective political goal to alienate Iran. The agreement could also pave the way for the region's Sunni Arab kingdoms um, and the Jewish majority Israel enhancing regional cooperation against their common foe, which is the more aggressive Shia Iran. So this is, this is canny international geopolitical uh, maneuvering. And you don't need a PhD in political science to understand it. You just have to read, uh, study, pray, and uh, ask God for the insights necessary to discern how all this is beginning to fit together. Significance of the agreement is the last section. Here, again, we begin to anticipate the impacts that I'll talk about much more in uh, parts two and three. First of all, the agreement shows how the Arab countries are gradually decoupling themselves from the Palestinian cause. That's huge because the Palestinian cause has been the ramrod, ramrod the point of the sword in, in regional politics and violence and war uh, for generations. So this is a massive seismic shift, a sea change and international politics in the Arab world. Don't lose the significance of that. Second, the deal buys the UAE a lot of goodwill in America. They know that we'll start looking at them very differently because they're willing to make peace with our most beloved uh, foreign nation, Israel. It's, it's smart politics. Where its image has been tarnished uh, by its recent involvement in the bloody, the indescribably bloody Yemen war that is still going on. You know, a lot of this is crass pragmatics. And, you know, it's hard for me not to comment on it. The bloody and careless politics of not only domestic, but also foreign policy so many times. And that's, that crosses party lines. Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians. Uh, what else is left? Marxists, socialists, know-nothings. <laughs> yeah, it is the nature of man, beloved. I'm talking to you about this is the nature of man. Fortunately for us who read the scriptures, that nature of man has powerful implications for what's going on right now in front of us in the news every day. Uh, also, very significant, I put a sailor on this. Other Gulf states in the region like Bahrain, uh, or Bahrain, however it's pronounced, and Oman, are very likely to follow suit. There's already talks going on with a number of the other mates. This is, the ground is moving quickly, boys and girls. It's moving very quickly. Can you feel it? Next, if the Arab states do fall in line, and I expect they will, for the most part, it would dramatically bring all Sunni nations in the region into an anti-Iran alliance with Israel. Iran is locked, uh, hip joint and, and mind and heart to, to Russia. So, yeah, I can't jump ahead of the game, but some of you are already ahead of me. The Russian-Iran alliance is being uh, 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 sectioned off from all of this, while the Sunni Arab nations are joining Israel now in another call. This is just so important. Finally, in South Asia, it will put Pakistan in a bind, another uh, uh, regard, uh, another nation regarded as a bandit nation, renegade nation, with nuclear arms. Whether to follow UAE steps, uh, whether Pakistan will also want to give up the Palestinian cause in the region, or not to follow UAE, since it's already in a feud with the Saudis over not taking up something called the Kashmir case. You can look into that for your own. I mean, this is, I, I'm just trying to, point out the, the understandable elements, the, the, the underlying interstitial tissue is very complicated beyond uh, my poor ability sometimes, but I can, I, can, I can grasp the generalities, which 
I think is a good beginning. Thesis Redux. This was admittedly taken from Arab news sites, but it still captures the pragmatic meat of these agreements or this agreement for our examination. So there's a lot to chew on. You can view what I'm presenting today as something to, this is your homework. This is your homework, Christians. It's not enough to just read the 23rd Psalm again. You'll forgive my, my sarcasm, maybe. Apply the scriptures to what's going on out there. There's a practical theological strength and power in doing that. Uh, it is the essence of what I call in my book, uh, Political Eschatology. I forgot. I forgot from there what I wrote in my book. Political Eschatology. The, the fusing, the joining of scripture and, and international geopolitical events to understand them from the best we can, not perfectly, God's mind's point of view. It's the only point of view that matters. Now here's something more startling and being debated at this early juncture. The initial, I believe more and more, I believe more and more that this is the literal initial phase of the seven-year peace agreement with Israel by someone who will be made known as the Antichrist referenced in the annals of the prophet Daniel. I'm going to quote Daniel 9, 27 here, which is the the pivot, the, the, the stanchion upon which almost all last day's prophetic uh, understanding rests. I'm not going to comment on it yet. It'll be dealt with later, but I'm introducing it into the discussion, into the thought process, into the reflection. Now, Daniel 9, 27, and he, the Antichrist, shall enter into a strong and firm agreement with the many, very important phrase, with the many, the many who? The many Arab nations, okay? It's not, it's not uh, rocket science. With the many and offering to cease for the remaining three and one half years and upon the wing or pinnacle of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the full determined end is poured out on the desolator. So much there, but I want you to understand this is, the pivot uh, doctrine, if you will, of the Old Testament, that it was revealed to Daniel, uh, who was asked in the 12th chapter again, to seal up these things until the end of time when God would make it understood more than ever before. We're there. Um, I find that daunting, but terribly exciting in the sense that God is revealing to us what he wants us to understand about these times. Why? Two reasons. One, that will be wise to them and can survive and succeed in them. And number two, lives will be saved. He is the God of rescue. Daniel's 70th week is pointed out here. Many of you already know what this is, but for those of you it's new, uh, for, for whom it is new, this explosive passage is possibly, I think, the most important one our generation shall have to consider. I do. It's that important. To master in the days ahead. For now. Uh, I merely introduce uh, all of this uh, Daniel 70th week, which is the literally the last week of human history, as we know it, as I say in the subtitle of the book. So let's get to the teaching, checking on time. Yeah, got to move along. Uh, the teaching from the scriptures, uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Uh, rather than breaking it down into key terms, I'm going to read it once more into the record. It's that important. Then I'm going to uh, uh, give you a couple of comments about background and interpretation. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, again, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. It all began here. A uh, little background information from um, 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 William McDonald. I'm going to quote William McDonald a lot today, so half-hearted apology up front. I love the guy, especially his New Testament commentaries. Old Testament sometimes not as strong, but the New Testament stuff is, is rich. Um, but on this particular passage in Old Testament, he, uh, he rose above and beyond the call, I think. Here's just a little bit. <clears throat> of the background. The call of the Lord had come to Abraham when he was still in Ur, Ur, uh, the, uh, the ancient area of Mesopotamia from which, he, from which he was called. 
uh, Abram was called, and this is significant, to leave his country, his family, and his father's house, leave everything he knew and loved behind, and to embark on a life of pilgr pilgrimage, Hebrews eleven nine. You know what? God calls us to be willing to do the same thing. Pastors, penitents, congregants, we have to be willing to do the same thing. It's not likely he will call most of us to do what Abraham did and, you know, move to another country that he didn't know. But we have to be willing. We have to be willing to be a pilgrim for Jesus Christ. God made a marvelous covenant in this passage from the Hebrew word berith, which literally means treaty. It's interesting. With him, which included the following significant promises. One, God promised Abraham, at the time Abram, he promised him if Abraham would obey, if he would agree, if he would not cheat on the agreement, he promised him these things. One, a land, that is the land of Cavan, uh, Canaan, which uh, the older name for it is Levant, including Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and greater Israel. It's a massive, massive uh, geopolitical part of, of the region. Uh, they would be given the promised land forever. Forever. Uh, you know, this covenant, I think I have it later on. When, did, when was this covenant struck? M most of the anthropological and historical evidence suggests is about 2116 BC, 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago. Uh, second, a great nation, namely the Jewish people. God, and don't ask me why, except that the scriptures say he loved them. Uh, he selected the Jews to make them an extraordinarily great people. Ask him why. All right. Third, he promised them great prosperity, both material and spiritual, for Abram and all of his seed. Fourth, to the friends of Israel, very important today, would be, I got a little mistake there, would be special, they would all be specially blessed, but anti-Semites would be singularly cursed. God meant exactly what he said. Yeah, there's that other side of God. I keep bringing it up because I don't hear about it ever, anywhere, ever. I'm starting to hear a little bit more about it though in my old home Friday church and pumps me up a little bit. Um, Thus through Israel, all the families of the earth would be blessed and Abram or cursed, pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ's uh, advent, who would be a descendant of Abram, a direct descendant of Abram. Finally, this covenant was renewed and enlarged in Genesis 13, uh, 14 through 17, 15, 4 through 6, 17. You can read all that. It was renewed. It's as if God came back to Abraham and, and those who followed him said, yeah, I meant it. Yeah, just so you don't forget. Yeah, I meant it. And then it was enlarged and, and the details uh, sunk into the covenant over time more and more. So God's timeline, I just mentioned it a moment ago. Now we turn to the more, to one more commentary to fill in the entire picture of this event to give us a, a just an introductory feel for it. The call of Abraham came again around 2000. 116 BC, I checked about a half a dozen sources, close as I could get, to the founding of the state of, from that year to the founding of the state of Israel, 1948, was 4,114 years. No, I don't know that that number has any special significance, except for this, God takes his time, doesn't he? He's long suffering to reach his goals, but here's the good thing. He always accomplishes every goal always fulfills every promise, never forsakes the promise. Personal, historical, international, and national. That's a big deal for me. Didymus. Matthew Henry then, a uh, brief statement from him. <laughs> brief, I'm never brief. Uh, God made choice of Abram and singled him out, for some reason, from among his fellow idolaters, which was the case in the polytheistic region from which he came in the land of Ur, that he might preserve, that he might reserve a people for himself. 
I don't know that I should even say it's it's hearsay. It's not documentable. But I've heard it said that the Christian body of Christ is the bride for Jesus and the bride for Yahweh is Israel. Uh, don't quote me on that. Don't mess with me. It's just an anecdotal thing I've heard a few times over the centuries I've walked this earth. Among whom his true worship might be maintained till the coming of Christ. True worshipers, Jews and Christians, Jews and Christians, joined at the, at the root and the stump of the tree forever. Don't forget that. From henceforward, henceforward, Abram and his seed are almost the only subject of the history in the Bible. Abram was tried whether he loved God better than all and whether he could willingly leave all to go with God. Hello? You got your own trials going on about that? Yep. Wouldn't be surprised. I'd be surprised if you weren't being so tested. As the sifting continues. All the true blessedness the world is now or ever shall be possessed of is owing to Abraham and his posterity. We go back to Father Abraham. We all do. Or more appropriately, we go back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Yeshua. Um, where am I? Through them, then, Abram and his posterity, we have a Bible, we have a Savior, and a Gospel. And it all starts right there, all the way back, 4,116 years ago, in terms of human history. <clears throat> in some, we can now begin, I think, to grasp the apocal measure of this covenant struck in God's blood, fire, and smoke, because that's how that thing has been struck and fought over and re-emplaced. It will not be moved, though man try to do so. Uh... Long before he gave the law to Moses on hand-rich stone tablets on Mount Sinai, long before he gave his only begotten son to be tortured and slaughtered on that mottled cross on that day of days, or before he promised to John on Patmos that he would return to rescue the faithful and destroy the wicked. Both are going to take place. So from Genesis through Revelation and all in between, God's covenant with Israel ramifies through the centuries of mankind. As sure, and I get a little poetic here, but you'll forgive me. As sure as his mighty bow aimed and fired that Jewish arrow straight and true to finally find its mark at the end of history as we have known it. And beloved, I say boldly, not sheepishly, we are ever, ever, ever so near to them. All of this, ever so near. Not setting dates, however tempting. Last thoughts. Ah, uh, yeah. So I can't add a lot to what we've already, you know, put down as mere introduction. Um, but I want to, I'm, I'm going to go out on a little bit of limb here. There's been a debate on, you know, is America, I don't see America in the last days. I don't, I don't see her mentioned. I don't, you know, the, some say it's a, I think it's a, uh, an offspring of, of some of the European uh, nations. England in particular, uh, not going to go into that. But while I'm wondering about it, and I didn't plan to include this, I believe more and more that I read and pray and reflect and watch and observe that America's destiny is being shaped into dark contours, even as I write these words. What I'm going to read now is not a happy set of thoughts, but I'm more interested in the truth and making you happy. I want to encourage you because truth does that. But I'm not too interested in making folks happy in the lighter sense of that phrase. To this crucial point, I stumbled across a, an eerily prescient book by a Christian author, attorney, and political analyst, analyst uh, novelist, basically, by the name of John Price. I'll tell you the title of his book in a minute because it's a bit of a giveaway. He wrote this, he published this in 2013. I went online and found him interviewed on a, a, a one or two Christian television broadcasts. Uh, terribly intelligent, articulate, careful, clearly a scholar of history and theology, uh, trained in the law. Uh, I found him impressive. 
or I would not have included this. But he's writing a novel now. This is fiction in 2013. He, here's the theme of the book. Fictional story of a future American president gone fully rogue, especially in the context of a sitting down of a stolen election. Here's a few lines from the book. My country is being led by a thief, the main character says, or at the very least led by a man surrounded by thieves, obviously with his willing consent and direction. End quote. He, he goes on, the narrative goes on. He had learned in his American history classes that in 1960, John Kennedy's supporters in Cook County, Illinois, had held out voting results until they knew how many votes were needed to put their candidate in the lead of the final state needed to win the White House. I remember back then as I was doing my study on Kennedy, there was a matter of a few hundred votes, a few hundred, that on which the presidency turned. Um, that was an historical embarrassment, but nothing like what just happened in states across the country in this fic fictitious scenario. This was an organized, orchestrated, and overt stolen election. Look. To quote the president, it is what it is. Um, I can read, I can think, I can listen, I can observe, I can discern sources that I think are more or less reliable, just like you can. I hope you can. Clearly, our president has made a major issue of the November 3rd election and the whole matter of of uh, balloting, how we're going to, how we're going to do the balloting. Kind of turn this thing off again. Messengers. Um, you know, so there was a statement just yesterday. I didn't write it into the record, so I don't want to be inaccurate. Basically, he, when he was asked by a reporter, you know, what do you have to say about the election? Well, you know, we are not going to see the results right away. It may take days, it may take weeks, it may take forever. Or his statement was, we may never find out the results of the November 3rd election. Look, I don't care what party you attend. I don't give a rip what church you go to. But you better be, if you're a follower of the Messiah, you better be attentive to these matters. They are grave and they're going to impact every single one of us. Now in this life, hear me now, and in the life to come at the beam of judgment when Jesus stands you before him for that special interview and says, what did you do in that hour? So no, it doesn't take a doctorate in political science to begin to connect the theological, national, and geopolitical dots here, but I'm not going to do that fully yet. I've already given away some of it. But I prefer that each of you start studying this stuff on your own. Dig in. Read the news. Read the scriptures, most important. Uh, drag out some commentaries. Uh, both classical and contemporary. Do your homework. I know everybody's busy. But if you don't have an hour a day for the Lord, I don't think you can accrue. I don't think you can accumulate the collective wisdom to understand these very turbulent times. You need to, because God commands you to do it, number one. And number two, so you can be a beacon of light and truth and life to your family and your neighbor. They're really kind of simple. I get to a coda. For now then, let us all understand the sheer immensity of the present moment in American and biblical super history, because that's where we are. At a, as I say in the book uh, that I wrote, at a crossroads. One branching to the left, taking us toward, and I don't mean politically necessarily, toward uh, the gaping abyss described by Gertrude Himmel, Himmelfarb, and then, or to the right, I wrote in 2017, to what I call a possible grand refreshment, a turning toward God, the God who founded us, in the very first place. The question hangs in the air, demanding yet resisting an answer. And that's why the subtitle of this, this series. Has America already crossed the Rubicon, past the point of no return, and our destiny is cast in dark contours? Or do we still have time for a massive, albeit collective, hurried course correction? around before and following November 3rd. Do we still have air to breathe, 
opportunity for rescue of a nation? Or are we left with just rescuing souls? I have an opinion. Those opinions will come forth more and more. But this much I'll say for now. To our American politicians and our church leaders, I hope you're listening. Please listen to the words of Jesus Christ, your Master, your Messiah. This is from Matthew 537. In this context, let your yes be simply yes and your no be simply no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one. No more, no more flip-flop. No more straddling the fence. No more intermediate positions while you reflect that. No, that time is gone. It's time for binary truth. This is right. This is wrong. This is true. This is false. This is good. This is evil. God demands it. I could quote six more scriptures, but you already know them. McDonald again on this particular passage. For the Christian and his fellows, an oath is unnecessary. All he wants is yes should mean yes and no should mean no. To use stronger language is to admit that Satan, the evil one, rules your life. Francis Schaeffer again and again shouting with spittle probably flying out of his mouth. There is no neutrality. There never was. But certainly today, I know I'm getting intense again. So is the one whom I serve. There are no circumstances under which ever, McDonald concludes, ever, ever, that a Christian should lie. Ever. If you want a New Testament example of that, you can revisit the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And all they lied about was a piece of land profit. Therefore, in this era of Antichrist, that's what I call it, because that's what it is, and all its myriad dark deceptions, the first ensign of a true disciple of Jesus Christ is twofold. One, know the truth. Two, live and speak the truth. You don't have an alternative. Well, you do, but you don't. If you're a real disciple of Christ, know the truth. You've got to study. You've got to get into it to do that. Two, live and speak the truth. Not perfectly, but as best you can. There is grace, so long as that's your motive. A whole lot of grace, if that's your motive. That's not your motive, and your motive is to lie. There is no grace. There is not. It is a matter of the heart, beloved, more than conduct. God looks at the heart. What's your heart? You want the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God? Or do you want to weasel and squiggle and squeeze and, you know, get at, you know, slip and slide? I pray not. The divine implication, therefore, all those ostensible, this is going to be even harder. All those ostensible believers who cannot meet that first test of knowing and living and speaking truth, and you don't want to, listen carefully to the Lord, what he has to say to you. Should you choose, continue to choose that dangerous path. They told you beforehand, in the last days, in the end time, there will be scoffers which literally translates in the Greek, by the way, as false teachers who seek to gratify their own unholy desires, following after their own ungodly passions. Therefore, whoever does not welcome you, those of you who are true, nor listen to your message as you leave that house or city, hear me now, no, hear the Messiah, shake the dust of it off your feet in contempt, breaking all ties. Do you hear the Lord? You cannot keep company with those who refuse these basic commands from the Lord. The time is done for that. It's just gone. In some ways, I'm sorry to be so intense, but the more I, I reflect and pray and look and listen, these are dangerous times. By the way, that combination of scripture is from Jude 118 and Matthew 10, 14. And I repeat, breaking all time, ties that God's sifting would continue. The great amount of it is done by the divine hand. But you have a choice to 
as long as free will exists, you can choose to be sifted into or away from God's ark. It's up to you, you know? So to the church, all this then, all of this that I've merely scratched the surface of and introduced, that we Christ followers, true Christ followers, might focus on our mission upon the ones. See, here's why I unfriend or even block some who want to make trouble for the truth, and that's their obvious goal. I remove them. I just remove them. I simply don't have any time left for it. I've argued three and a half years now with many, if not most of them. And after three and a half years, I don't know about God's timing, my time is up. i got to move on to the ones, listen to this, straight from Matthew 5, 6, who hunger and thirst, truly hunger and thirst after his righteousness. Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter. I can usually tell if somebody really isn't gaming or, 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 you know, faking it. Can usually tell. And I don't care what they've done or who they are or what station of life. I will listen to any man, woman, or child who hungers and thirsts even that much after God and His righteousness. I'll spend all the time you need. But with the rest of you who don't want that who want some other goal, political power maybe, uh, a bigger house, self-aggrandizement, just get out of my house. Don't have time for you. Jesus said the same thing. I just, as Ephesians 5, 16 says, beloved, as time grows tight, tighter than a fist, as time grows tight, I want to spend my time with those who want God. It's awesome. It's precious. And it's greatly satisfying and lovely to see somebody asking questions. And you get to be the supplier of the answers for him. But I've grown pretty tough with those who are faking it. It didn't used to be this way, but I'm different now. We are all different now. I believe... His instructions could not be clearer or more sensible. So I'm doing the best I can to present them to you. I love you. And as my Kelly Maxim has said for many years now, yeah, love always tells the truth. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you. These are deep waters. I'm not an expert, but I can read and study. And, and by your grace and your wisdom and your courage, get me to you know, first base, if not second or third, and get us off the ground a little bit to, to start studying and thinking and most importantly, praying for these things. The movement of the spirit of the Lord in the land and our adversary is so rapid. now. Let that be food for excitement and exuberance because your return is sooner and sooner. But between now and then, we've got a lot of work to do. So we thank you and praise you to excite and exhort and lift up every heart for those who need to go before you and say, you know, Lord, ha, I got to get a few things straight. Just do it. I heard my my young pastor, Daniel, say deliciously in church, uh, uh, Friday church last night on, on the internet, just tell God the truth. You know, I could cry because you showed me that. Just tell you the truth. Please, Lord. Please. In Christ's name. Amen. Love you all. See you next time. Pray for me.